originally called WebVR, and then we changed the name to WebXR when that term became popular. And then when the uh, pandemic started this past year, I took a pause, and then we had a baby. Uh, and so now I'm kind of back, and I really enjoy doing these sessions together with Aisha Gul. And it's really meant to kind of explore together with the audience to see what we can do with A-Frame and WebXR in general. Um, my background is a weird mix of entrepreneurship, video technology, software development. And then over the past five years, this has kind of been my hobby of doing cool WebXR projects on the side. Uh, maybe someday it'll be my job, but uh, not at the moment. Um, so that's a little bit about the background. Maybe we could talk a bit about what we're going to do today. What we're doing today is we're building on the foundation of what we had created last time. And what we had created last time was uh, the ability for us to create any streetscape in our A-frame scene that we can use for lots of different things. Now, last time we used that for creating a proposal of how we could have a safer street for a, a, a section of street in San Francisco. I thought this time we would go in a very different direction and we would look at how we can use the same sort of infrastructure we created, but to make some games out of it. Before we start, um, you can kind of see I have two windows open here. And on the left side, I have this doc and anyone can access it. Yeah, I just pasted the link on the chat. Awesome, yeah. Um, and so this is uh, free to view and it also includes, I'll scroll up, everything from the first uh, episode, which includes about 30 minutes of a beginner intro to web development of any type, so very beginner friendly. Uh, it uses Glitch, which we'll also use today, which is an in-browser code editor. In fact, here it is on this side. We'll dig into that in just a moment. And then the second part of the last episode, uh, we went through the exercise of creating the street demo that we talked about. And so by the end of the presentation, we came out with, let's find what the outcome was here. Here we go, 17th Prezo. So we'll take a look at what that was. Anyone else okay. joining um, who were here last week or the week before? Good question, yeah. So in this one, um, this is what we made last time uh, where we had a little presentation at the beginning using using a component, and then we added a map box component to do what you see here, showing the area. Um, and then we actually created uh, an example of what the street could look like using the street component. And using the presentation component, we were able to make this nifty animation, and I'm actually pressing the right arrow button. Uh, I can go back, I can go forward. Uh, and that changes the view according to a predefined set of camera positions that we had created. Oh, we have a couple of people who were here last time, Jen and Brian Meyer. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, and for, for those of you who missed it, uh, I just pasted the YouTube uh, video link mm. if you want to catch awesome. up later on. And that's also really, I'll just highlight one thing. Um, I think you created this, which is really nifty, that there's a little um, things in the timeline um, so it's really easy to find, like, here's the intro to A-Frame, here's the 3D street component, augmented reality. Yeah. Um, that's a really cool feature. How um, do you do that? Uh, show more. Yeah. So uh, you uh, just type yeah. in the times, and then it automatically uh, creates those chapters. Yeah, I love it, too. That's really cool. Um, cool. Uh, and then right before we, we started the call, Aisha Gull and I were just talking about our holidays. Uh, it's <laughs> on lockdown here in San Francisco. so. We each have uh, another friend or family in our circle, but that's it. So it's been yeah. a little bit quiet. So this is another form of us interacting with humanity. So thank you all for joining us. <laughs> yes, thank you. It really feels like the community. And um, yeah, also let us know if this format is good for you, uh, Twitch. We are not 100% uh, attached to Twitch stream. Uh, before I asked and people said like they do like Twitch, but we can change that for the next time too. Awesome. Cool. Well, then um, today I'll give an overview and then we can jump in. Um, I wanted to talk first about what is a game. I know it sounds like a dumb question, but I think it's kind of helpful as we jump into that. And then I have a couple different ideas to present uh, that we can do today. And we're going to start with a, the simplest version that allows us to do all of these, which is an endless flyer. And you'll see why that makes sense in a little bit, because it can be applied to lots of different uh, types of games. 
And then we're going to use a bunch of these different components and objects. And part of what we're going to do today is actually find some open source or Creative Commons licensed uh, objects and models on Sketchfab. And we're going to show how to import them into our scene. And this is a really helpful way to get really awesome assets for making cool games. Um, I don't know how much time we're going to have for the second half of this stuff, looking at uh, collision detection, character movements, or score. So we'll see what we want to get done. Um, but by the end of this, we should at least have an endless flyer type of thing. Or you saw at the beginning, there's a little robot that is animated running along the streets. Um, and from there, we can build on that in future episodes. Is that what you mean by endless flyer, just endlessly running? Robot? Yeah, so there's a concept. Well, why don't we start with this? This is a, a concept, and I link it here. I don't know if you've heard of like Temple Run on iOS or Android. That was one of the first popular um, uh, examples of these endless runners. But it's a, it's a genre of game where the character is always running. Um, let's see if there's <laughs> another example. In fact, Unity has a really nice example of this as a project. I'm going to paste it here where we have a bigger view. Um, so of course, we're not doing Unity today. Uh, but this is an example of one where the cat is running along this alley and collecting old fish bones and trying to avoid things like trash cans. Yeah, cool. And so this is a this is a basic kind of game category, I guess you would call it. Um, and again, I think it's a relatively easy one to start with because there's a lot of constraints, um, and it's mm -hmm. pretty easy to get started. And we'll see um, how to animate kind of the the quick background. Me. Cool. So then, um, before we jump into the running part. Let's talk a little bit about what is a game and why this matters. So one really awesome uh, inspiration, and I don't, know, I don't know who is behind this, but it uses A-Frame. And it's a collection of games. You should check it out. Uh, and it's something like 50, 60 VR games. Um, now, none of them are like super amazing. They're not, not going to win awards. But whoever did this is very productive. <laughs> And if you play with them, you'll notice a couple things in common. So maybe we'll just load one of these. Um, I don't even know which one it is. We'll try. I haven't tried this one before. So again, each of these is made in A-frame. You can see because of the trademark thing in the corner and lots of other little elements that look A-frame-ish. Um, but they have many things in common. I don't know how to play this one, but we'll see if we can figure it out. What am I supposed to do? Oh, so I got one point somehow. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea what's happening in this one. Um, but let's let's look at another one, and we'll we'll recognize what the things are in common. Uh, Sketch Rush. Let's see what that one has. Uh, I see. So this one, you have a uh, different color balls flying at you, and you have to connect it. Um, so it seems like these games are really simple, and they are. But they're not simple to program, <laughs> even if it looks <laughs> simple to play. Uh, and so that's what we're going to learn uh, a little bit later. So the thing that I like about these is that there's something that's really all common with all of them. There's a score. There's some sort of constraint. Uh, you know, you have time or the speed of the objects that come there. Um, and I think another thing that's important to consider is the user interface works both in VR mode and on desktop mode. So you see that I'm right now in the desktop browser mode, and I'm able to still play with the elements. Um, the other thing about all these games, the, the DS effects, is that there's not super fancy objects or textures. This is a pretty lightweight set of games on purpose. And we're also going to see later today what happens when we overload with too much stuff uh, and <laughs> what happens when your browser crashes. Um, so <laughs> That's I thought, great. Yeah, I thought these were a really good set of examples. And I encourage you to check them out and go easy on the developer. I know some of them kind of look cheesy, but like. This person made 56 of them, <laughs> and it's pretty it's pretty remarkable. Um, and I think we're going to use a lot of these kind of core elements as we continue to create some of these sample games. Maybe that was somebody's new resolution last year. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I need to create 60 games this year. Um, well, they did it. Uh, so that's that's a really good example. Um, so then that kind of got me thinking: what are some game types that we could create? that would be achievable in one or two episodes that we do for these live streams. And I came up with a couple ideas. Um, um, sorry, we have, a, we have a question. Um, so one question is um, how to use Xbox joystick uh, Quest VR controllers with A-Frame. Um, so we, uh, there is an input library on uh, Immersive Web GitHub. We need to include that in automatically supposed to uh, detect which um, 
controller that you're using. So I'm not sure if we can get to that, but I'll paste the link and then we'll get to that next time, if not this time. Yeah, I think we, we may not have time for input this time. I, I have an idea to do something really quick and dirty for this episode, um, but we will get into more interaction probably in the next one when we get into teleporting, movement, and all that stuff. Um, yeah. But it's a good question. Um, I'll paste the library that you need to include. The instructions cool. are there too. Okay. Cool. Um, so then I was brainstorming, what are some games that we can create? And one of the concepts was an endless runner. Um, and then there's other games that kind of build off of the street component, like Frogger. Now, you may recall in the last episode, if you watched it from the beginning, one of my goals is to promote safer streets, or streets that are safer for all users, not just cars. And um, Frogger is actually a really good way to show the difference between different types of streets. But that's going to be a little <laughs> complicated for this episode. Um, but there are some examples of, of folks that made uh, some really fun little games, mini games, and I'll show two of them. This one I like a lot. It's called Cross the Street. And I'll play the video so you can see it. And again, all these links are in the document. Ah, and it yeah. looks like Golden Gate Bridge. <laughs> right. And so they came up with a fun mechanic of movement that's based on, I think, your, your hands moving, or you jumping up and down, or both. Um, and so it's like a first person Frogger view. Uh, so this is a, this is oh, a really yeah. cool example. And I think we may use some of the concepts here when we put a, a Frogger game together. And then there was another one I found that was a little bit older. Open this in the new window. Bring it over here. Yep. So this one's meant to be played with your controller, so it's not going to get rid of that view here. But you see the same basic elements, right? You have vehicles moving across. Uh, there's actually some good sound effects um, that I like. And uh, again, I, I'm not in VR mode, so I can't really uh, play this one. Um, but you, you get the idea. Actually, we can do a little bit of jumping. A little bit. OK. Let's see what happens when we get hit by the car. It seems like at rate limits, you you can only move. Boom. Oh. OK. <laughs> um, so really good, really good prior art here uh, for Frogger. So that should be a, a, an attainable goal. Um, and then we talked a bit about the endless runner concept. So that's another concept I think would be achievable for us. And something that kind of combines both of these is Paperboy. I don't know if you all have played that back in the day for the legacy Nintendo Entertainment System, the 8-bit version. Uh, let's see if there's mm -hmm. some. There we go. This is a perfect view. So um, in this game, there's a bicyclist, a cyclist that's delivering uh, newspapers. So this starts to combine the endless runner concept, because you can't stop. You have to keep going with shooting uh, some sort of object or throwing some sort of object. So this is this is something that we could build up to, but I think this is a little more advanced. Uh, but I think we can get there. And again, the thing in common with all these is that it's using the street component. Uh, and so I was trying to kind of use that constraint. And then to start with, I thought we would do a much more slimmed down version of an endless runner. And I'm calling this the endless flyer, because uh, I have some <laughs> helicopter models that we can use so that it gives it a sense of motion and, and animation and purpose to why we're moving along. Um, cool. Any any questions about that so far? Does this all make sense? Um, I do not see any so far. Cool. But this is really cool. And um, cool. have you ever played the um, flight simulator from Microsoft? I haven't played the newest one, but I've seen videos of it, and I think it. It's pretty realistic looking. Same, yes. Yeah. I, I think they're using the Bing Maps data for it. And uh, yeah, That's it right. would be nice to play with something like that. That's a really cool idea. I have not looked at the Bing Maps API, but I should do that for our next one. Um, so then what are the components that we're going to need to make these projects work? This isn't an exhaustive list, but it's a little bit of a summary here. So we're going to use the street components that is rendering the view that you see on the right side of the screen. Um, we're going to learn how to use the animation component to move characters uh, or objects in the scene. And we're, we are going to dig into how do we get some cool objects or models in our scene that could be our characters. Um, and so I found a couple here. You can see little previews of a chicken. Uh, there's a fox. Uh, there's a cat. And there's a robot. Um, so we'll, we'll dig into some of these, and I'll show you how do we adapt those from Sketchfab, including the animation. And that's another component we're going to use today, which is the animation mixer component, which essentially just plays animations from a GLTF file for that object. If we have time today, we'll also get into colliders. But I think that's going to be pretty much it. Uh, there's a lot of stuff 
above here to get, get to get through. And I don't think we're going to have time for character movement controls, um, but maybe we will. We'll see. Um, and then keeping score and stuff, good thing to do, but I think that's also going to be for a future future episode. Great. Then let's get started with the first part of this project. And what I'm going to do is show you a really old project that I did in 2017. And you'll notice if you're hip with all your A-frame stuff, um, this is an old version of A-frame. Right now, A-frame is on version 1.1. But this is a, a really old, old project. But I wanted to show it to you because it's very simple. It has very few objects in the scene, very few entities. And it is pretty easy to understand what's going on. Uh, and this is a, kind of our V1, if you will, of an endless flyer. So what's going on in the scene? You may remember that we have the A-frame inspector. So I think that's a really good way to see what's going on. So I'm going to press Control-Alt-I on that scene. And it's going to load the inspector, assuming that it works in that version of A-frame. It does. So we see a couple things. There's really not much to the scene. We have a camera. We have the sky. We have an ocean. We have a couple lights. We have a helicopter. And I do this little trick where I actually have another copy of the helicopter beneath it to make it look like a reflection. But it is literally another helicopter just in reverse underneath the ocean. So it kind of looks like a reflection. That looks so, really good, though. Yeah, it's a little trick. Um, so the scene is actually very simple. And if we go and open up the tree beneath the helicopter, we also see that we have a rotor that spins. Pretty simple. And we'll get to animation in a little bit. Um, and then here's another trick that we do. And that is that we take the ocean. And the thing that's moving this scene, we'll go back to the scene, is actually not the helicopter. So the helicopter is remaining in the same position the whole time, but we're moving the ocean instead. And for a lot of reasons, that, that is pretty simple to do. <laughs> um, and then we don't have to worry about how far our main camera goes, moving our camera, et cetera. It all can kind of just stay here. So we're going to do the same thing with our new scene. Uh, but I'm, I'm upgrading. And I'm not going to show you the code in this one, because some of the things are out of date. Um, so I think that's a good place to start. Um, but we're going to put it up in the new version of A-Frame so that I'm not confusing people with different syntax. And the thing that's changed, just to be clear, is that the, the an way animations were defined in old versions of A-Frame is different now. So hmm. um, we're going to stick to the upgraded version. So. And um, we have to mention, uh, not every um, version of A-Frame is backward compatible, right? Right. Yeah. So when you change the version, um, it's Thanks. important to test it and see if it's if it's still working. Um, so while this is loading, so it's loading the code. Let's see what it looks like here. And also, while that's loading, I'm going to open up the helicopter model from Sketchfab that we're going to use. Uh, in the version that you just saw from 2017, that was an old, older, very simple looking uh, helicopter. So this one is a little bit nicer looking um, that we're going to get from Sketchfab. So this is what this is what we're going to put together. Um, so let's start with the model and how do we get that to work, and we'll go back to the animation of the ocean. So I like to look for uh, models on Sketchfab. It's almost like a fun pastime. And often what I'll do is that when I have the idea for what I want to search for, um, I'll do the following. So let's say for helicopter. I'm going to type in helicopter. But there's two things that I also check. And that would be downloadable and animated, mm. for our example. And then there are lots of great assets that you can purchase. And you'll see them highlighted. Uh, and they'll have a dollar sign next to it. Um, so either up here, you'll see the dollar sign. Or right there, you'll see a dollar sign available on store. Um, and instead, if I am on a budget, <laughs> I look for things that are downloadable that don't have a fee. Um, so I look through a bunch of them. There's, I mean, there's amazing things on Sketchfab. And they're available um, with a reasonable license. So for each one, you can double check the license. And for most nonprofit projects, it's totally fine. Some of them have restrictions on what you can do commercially. Um, but this one, even, you could use for commercial purposes. Um, so I think it's a great example. The other thing, the other reason why I chose this is that it has the animation of the rotors built into the GLTF. So we don't have to muck around with trying to separate the different parts, animating those on our own. So we get a lot oh, of stuff awesome. for free. Yeah, it's pretty nice. Um, so I wanted to show you what is it actually like uh, when we download this model? What exists in the file? So there's a, a couple different formats you can download it with. 
Um, I almost always download it, the GLTF version, and then I'll modify it from there. Um, cool. So, um, so I have a um, whole list of places that you can get assets from, and uh, I just pasted awesome. that. Um, because lots so of museums you, have 3D models now, too. Yeah. So, so can you all see this uh, finder window? I just want to make sure that it's uh, I, I do. Yes. OK, great. Um, so this is the zip file that I just unzipped that came from Sketchfab. And so we see three files here. There is scene.gltf, there's scene.bin, and then there's the texture. And one thing I always want to be aware of for the web is that uh, people access this in a variety of devices and in different conditions. And this is a pretty big file. So this is almost one megabyte of this texture for the helicopter. And you can see it here. It's nicely textured so that it combines it all into one file. So they did a good job with their um, UV arrangement or whatever you want to call it. Um, but it's really, really big. And especially for the use case that we're doing, we don't need super fine resolution. So I think that's a really easy place for us to optimize. So I'm going to use two different tools to optimize this, uh, actually three. So the first one is I'm going to open up the, G the GLTF by itself. Um, and let me explain the difference here. So GLTF, this file, is a text file that is editable by humans, but it's not very fun to edit. But it is possible. <laughs> um, the bin file is binary data that is not editable by humans, and you don't even want to try it. But there are other tools if you really get excited about the stuff that lets you play with it. So let's take a look at what's in here, and I'll explain why we're opening it up. So what I want to do is that I actually want to change this PNG that's one megabyte. I want to change it into a JPEG. Um, so first, before I change it in the GLTF, I'm going to make a copy of this. So I'm going to export. I'm just using Finder that's built into Mac OS. I'm going to do a JPEG. And I want to really bring down the quality level. Now, you notice I didn't resize it. Sometimes that causes problems with the UV coordinates. You can mm -hmm. experiment. But I'm going to keep the, the, the resolution exactly the same. But I'm going to really crank down the compression. And I guarantee at the levels that we're doing, you're not going to see it. Um, so and it looks like the lowest we can get is about 180 kilobytes, which is a big savings. So I'm going to close this. We'll double check. Oh, shoot. Where did I save it to? Question. Let me make sure I save it in that same folder. There we go. OK. Save it in here. We'll turn down the quality. Save it. OK, now it's in here. Uh, wow, that was we got it down to 41 kilobytes. That's crazy low. Um, but you can still see it looks fine. So um, the next thing I want to do, I'm going to search the GLTF here for a reference to PNG, and I found it right here. And I'm literally going to change this into, uh, I think it, it used JPG. Yeah. See if there's any other reference. So that's it. That's the only thing I'm going to edit. I just changed the three letters of PNG into JPG. So now it's referencing this file, but we always want to check to make sure that it's working and it's still a valid GLTF file. So something I use a lot is this open source GLTF viewer from Don McCurdy. And it's something I keep bookmarked. Oops. Um, and I'll just include it right here. Cool. Uh, Thank you. Um, I made a list of, OK, that's great. So what I did here, you notice I didn't select the PNG. I've only selected the GLTF, the bin, and the JPEG. And let's see if it works. So I'm going to drag these things over here. And it does work. And that's exactly what we wanted to see, right? So we see um, the helicopter animation that's moving. Uh, and we see that the texture, it looks fine from this distance, right? If we zoom in really close, you can see there's a lot of pixelation. <laughs> and these are compression artifacts. But you know, this is a web game. <laughs> it's OK. Um, and we basically saved like 90% of the file size by just doing that. So every time I get something from, from Sketchfab, it, I do take a, a few minutes to try to optimize it. And the simplest way to optimize it is really to compress the textures down. Um, now, there's pros and cons to this. It does add a little bit of loading time because it has to decode the JPEG, but it doesn't really matter. So um, it's definitely worth it. Now, the other thing I want to do, so I'm going to delete this PNG, is combine this all into one file. This is really helpful if you're using a platform like, uh, like Glitch, where you have to reference the files uh, on a directory system. Um, so I'm going to go to the Downloads folder. And this is the Bell Huey Helicopter. Ugh. 
I've done this enough times that, oh, okay, this is probably, okay. Uh, Timestamp right on that? Yes, we have one JPEG. Okay, great. Um, so then we're going to use a tool called VLTF Pack. And this does two things. So how do we explain this? There's uh, a really good repo called Mesh Optimizer. And what this does is it, it takes whatever you have uh, from a GLTF file, and then it reorganizes in the file how it um, displays and defines the vertices and all sorts of other optimizations. So this guy who made this is a super genius. Um, I can't even get into I don't even know how to describe what it does, but it makes a big difference in how it loads. Um, the other thing it does as a bonus is that it combines it together in one file. No, that's an optional feature. So uh, if you look at the GLTF directory of Mesh Optimizer, this is where we have GLTF pack. And I follow the instructions here. You need Node Package Manager um, to just npm install dash g GLTF pack. And the result is, let me increase the size. This is really small. Um, I can type in GLTF pack, and I have access to it on the command line wherever I am. So in this example, what we want to do is we want to do gltf pack, and we want to do the input file of scene.gltf, right? And we want to do an output, and we want to do a glb. And the nice part about a glb is that it combines everything, including the textures, into one file. And so that makes it a lot simpler. So we'll call this bell.glb. Press Enter. And it doesn't do anything. It just does what it's supposed to do. It doesn't give you any exciting message. So I can't believe this, but it says it's 46 kilobytes. Uh, let's see if it actually works. <laughs> um, ah, sorry. Uh, so let's. I'm dragging just the bell into the scene. No, it didn't work. OK, I did something wrong. And honestly, I don't. Oh, you know what it is? I think I forgot the option for. Uh, Embed all textures. There we go. T. That's what I forgot. So the VLTF viewer didn't know what to do because textures that were defined in there uh, weren't found. Okay, this seems this makes more sense. About 90 kilobytes, 87 kilobytes. Okay, that seems right. Let's bring this over then. There we go. It works. So I just want to gloat for a second. We took a file that was about a megabyte, um, and we brought this down to about uh, 80. 88 kilobytes. Um, so that's like a, a power of 10 reduction, which is pretty good. Uh, and it's doing both the image compression that we did manually by changing it to a JPEG with higher compression, but it's also taking advantage of the magic that Mesh Optimizer does uh, to erase duplicate vertices, minimize draw calls, all this fun stuff. Uh, Great. We have another tool called rapidcompact.com from Jen um, oh. online. Thank you. That's cool. Yeah. there. Are, that's a good idea, too. There's some online tools that might be easier to use. So uh, thank you for sharing that. So um, what I had done already is you can see here that I've imported that. I had done this exercise before. Oh my goodness, that was 400 kilobytes. So I didn't do as good of a job as I had done on this episode. <laughs> <laughs> um, and just for fun, let's upload this, what I'm going to call this Bell V2, I'll call it. And I'm going to drag this into our Glitch project. And like everything else, this is linked in our file. You can open this. You can remix it yourself and follow along. Um, Kieran, can you paste, uh, paste the um, packaging, the command for the packaging file? Oh, yeah. PLS? Totally. So this was this one. Uh, Mesh Optimizer, and I also linked to the directory, uh, the GLTF directory. And that's what the tool is. And as you can see, it's a little bit rough around the edges. Like you got to double check what you're doing. You always got to check to see if it loads again in the GLTF viewer. But it really works. Uh, and so it's a good tool that I, I recommend. OK. Um, so we were in our assets for our Glitch project. And again, last time on, uh, on our intro episode, we had gone over how to use Glitch. And one of the components here is that there's a bunch of um, file storage that it offers. And so you can just drag and drop files in there that are accessible from your application. Um, so I'll copy the new helicopter that we up, uh, uploaded. Um, and then there's a couple other things. Mm -hmm. Here, uh, Phil Matry is asking for the one with the missing option. The one with the missing option. 
I am not sure which one is that. Um, right. Well, just to double check here, maybe I'll just kind of repeat what we did. So we, um, what we ended up doing was, uh, this is the actual um, thing that we ran on the command line. So it was GLTF pack, and then the option TE that embeds the textures, the input file, we just referenced the GLTF, and then the output file. And when we call it a GLB, it knows that it's going to combine all these things uh, with this texture into one file. Mm -hmm. And I'm um, pasting the options um, readme doc. Cool. Um, Thank you. Okay, so let's continue. So we have the assets here. The other assets that I've uploaded already are um, there's two different versions of the sky. This is a JPEG version, and then we also have an HDR version, which we'll use in a moment. Um, and then we also have an MP3 sound effect, but I'm we're not going to do sound today. It's it has some issues that I don't want to get into. Um, so let's look at the code. Um, I am going to go through kind of line by line. We can ignore the stuff at the top. And then we have a frame that's being loaded. We have the street component. Sorry, this is not the street component. This is the ocean uh, component. And then we have our, uh, our A-frame extras that we're going to use to animate the helicopter, which you'll see in a second. And then we have orbit controls, which I've added. Uh, and then this is another thing that we're going to get into, which is the HDRI environment that we add. And for just a moment, I'm going to disable some of these things. So I'm going to take off the HDR background. Um, um, should we explain what, what the HDR I environment is? Yes, uh, but I'm going to, what's that in a second? I'm actually just um, disabling it so we kind of see what things look like okay, uh, cool. without it. And I'm also going to take off orbit controls. I should have done this beforehand. I, I made the uh, project working. I should have <laughs> made a version that just didn't have very much on it. Um, and I also want to, I'm going to copy this in in a second. I'm going to take the animation off. I'll put it over here for a moment. OK, and then it should look kind of weird, um, <laughs> like not much going on. Uh, if I reload it, then it should see what the error is. Hmm. Oh, let me take this out, too. Maybe there's just not much there. So we have the helicopter. We have the camera. I disabled something I didn't want to disable. Ocean. Oh, it's working. It's just there's not much going on in the scene. <laughs> there's no it's lights. Yeah, yeah, there's no lights. So it's, it's working as expected because there's no background and there's not sufficient light to see the objects in the scene. Um, so you can barely see it right here with just the one light. Um, so it's kind of working. Uh, but this is what we wanted to talk about. So um, I should go, you probably know more about this than I do. What, what is HDRI and what is different about it than uh, normal JPEG? Um, OK, I hope I'm correct. But so basically, uh, what you have is a 3D image, I mean, um, an image that you wrap. And then you take the lighting from that image to reflect on the objects. That gives you kind of. Uh, very nice um, reflections most of the time, which is very nice, and a, a more realistic, real-life uh, lighting situation. That's right. Yeah, and you know, in this scene, we have a couple lights, but they're not really sufficient to light the whole scene properly. <laughs> and so we get two things kind of for free while we use this HDR component. So this is a special component that was written by Zach. Um, I can't pronounce his last name right. Uh, and this is part of his toolkit for an app called uh, VRTist. It's worth looking at uh, by itself, by the way. It's, an, it's a really interesting application. So I'll just show it real quick. Um, this is an app that lets you do uh, both two-dimensional and three-dimensional texture drawing and oh, to create nice. animations and stuff, all in WebXR or in the browser. Um, and so what he did is he actually released a lot of the tools that he used as part of it. Um, so you can actually draw on this. Um, you can import objects, and you can actually paint on the objects. So it's an interesting way to animate, sorry, to um, modify avatars. So you can bring in GLTF avatars and then paint it how you want, and then export it back out in, into something like hubs or other you know, VR chat, whatever it is. Um, this is really nice. So, yeah, so part of that, he has uh, this HDRI component, which makes it much easier 
to import an HDR file. Um, now let me uncomment those things so we can see now how the scene looks different. So I'll keep this open over here so you can see how different it looks when we open this up. Yeah, there we go. I think it's loading. OK, I think this is another case where it's working, but our camera is just in a weird position. OK, so you can already see that we see we see the ocean much better than we did before. And oh, we do have a helicopter. There it is. And it, you'll notice something really interesting. It, it's subtle, but it's important, is that this side of the helicopter is brighter than this side of the helicopter. And this gets to the magic of HDR, HDRI um, lighting when used in these 3D scenes. In order to re Replicate that manually would be a lot of work. Um, and it's a subtle effect, but it really adds a lot. And you can see it like this way. If you're looking at the helicopter, you see how this side is shaded a little bit lighter than this side. Um, and it really adds a lot of realism. This way, like when we're looking at it this way, it looks like a shadow or kind of a, a silhouette view. Um, but this way, you can tell that light's coming from behind us. So it adds a lot of awesome value. But here's the one downside. <laughs> These files are huge, and I have not played with how to optimize these things. In fact, these files are hard to use um, because they're not openable by all sorts of applications. So this one's five megabytes. I would like to learn how to optimize that because that's too big, uh, in my opinion, for uh, a background and um, a lighting file. But we're going to use it for today because I haven't figured out a way to optimize it. But this would be a big candidate for us to, to reduce the size. Now, where do they get this from? I actually paid for license for this one since I use it so much. This is a good site. Um, they're not too expensive. It's like 30 bucks, and it really makes a big difference in your scene. This site is really nice because the files that they give you don't have a ground. <laughs> um, and you know you can get free equi rectangular pictures from Flickr. I think we showed this last time. Um, but the problem with that is that they have a ground. And your scene usually has its own thing going on. And so the nice part about these is that it's just the sky. And what I usually do is I actually use Photoshop, and then I will double the sky, uh, put it at the top and the bottom. And it works especially nicely for ocean huh. scenes, because then you have the ocean at like 90% trans or ninety percent opacity. And you just have a little bit transparent, and it looks like a reflection of uh, the sky. Um, so that's a little trick. That's, that's a good tip. Yeah, and so I think at the moment, the only things that I can get to open HDR files like this are um, Preview in Mac and Photoshop, but it's it's a hard format to work with. Um, so lots of exciting things to optimize here. Uh, but for now, we'll use this really big file, but it adds the nice lighting effect that, that we're looking for. Any other questions on the HDRI and the background? Um, um, what else? We just have a comment. Here? Yeah. This helicopter scene is especially inspiring, even at uh, five megabytes. Yeah, it is really <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, it's not bad. Um, so then the, the other thing that Zach did, which is really clever, is that he combines this together so that in your sky component, where you're defining the sky, you can define that you want to use this HDR file for the environment. So in other words, the environment lighting, which applies it to the helicopter like we saw, and it uses that as the texture for the sky box at the same time, right? So we're using that both as the sky mm -hmm. and the lighting for the objects, two different things at the same time. So really? that's pretty nice. Yeah. Um, so the other thing that we saw was that the scene is kind of hard to navigate because we enter the scene and the camera's in the wrong position. Um, so I have already taken the time to kind of find a nice little setting for orbit controls. Um, this is another super handy, I use it a lot, component. Um, so let me close these and reload them. I'll close these tabs that we're not using anymore. So there what, we go. what were the settings that you changed for the orbit control? Um, so I have a couple of them. Good question. So uh, is this the right file? Yeah. Um, so uh, let me take off auto rotate because we don't need that right now. Um, I set a target. And you'll notice that the target is actually pretty high up. Um, 13 meters above the ground, so that's X, Y, Z, and Y in the middle is the height. Um, and the position uh, of the camera is also pretty high up. So again, when it loads, it puts the camera 13 meters high. It's looking at the helicopter at 14 meters high. And then the camera is uh, 15 plus 3, so 18 meters away uh, Z on the Z axis uh, from the helicopter. So in other mm -hmm. words, it's, it's basically close to the same height and about 15 meters away. 
which is a nice kind of place to start. We'll reload to see what that looks like when we start. So it's right, it's right on front. Um, and then the orbit controls and these settings let you define uh, what are the minimum distance and the maximum distance. This is a superfluous setting. Um, so it just basically says, how close can we zoom? Mm -hmm. Which is actually too close, because if you <laughs> should probably make this like six would probably be a better value, because in theory, you don't want your users to go inside of it unless that's part of your application. So let's reload and see what the difference is if we put six. Let's so stop. Yeah, so this lets you stop right there, and then you can set a maximum distance. So how far can you zoom out? And I think that's set to like 100, which is plenty. Um, and then, of course, the main reason why we do this is that you click and drag, and it works on mobile devices as well. And it provides a really nice basic user interface for almost any project. So, mm -hmm. um, one, one thing that the, works much better for every device is if you put the camera on zero zero zero, and then move maybe the C to yeah. minus, and uh, because yeah. yeah, for different devices, um, sometimes the headset or the phone is at zero That's zero right. zero. So if you were to enter in uh, the VR scene, you would probably start like right here, and it would be kind of odd. So I, I would agree that it's not, orbit controls are not for VR. So it's like, it works, it's great for everything except for VR, and then that's a different beast. Um, that's a really good point. Um, would uh, Phil said, would love to send you, send you your helicopter, how I can see it in VR mode. Oh, so, do you have a um, screenshot or anything like that, Phil? I you might be able to paste it here. I'm not sure. Um, I noticed that if I open the glitch project URL on my second monitor, it makes the text uh, much easier to read, and even the highlighting done is shown in real time. Yeah, that's <laughs> another nice thing about glitch that it does a lot of syntax highlighting. Um, you can even do things like. Formatting. Ooh, I don't know if I wanted that, but um, it has yeah. its own opinions about how it should format a file. Um, oh, I'll, I'll do that because I like having it a little more condensed. And MB Cool gave us a link for Zex demoing uh, VR V artists. Oh yeah, awesome. Data Hub. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. So the last thing that we want to add here is animation because our helicopter is kind of just hovering uh, in this odd position. Um, and so uh, this is something I think is worthy of taking a second and looking at the documentation, because it's, it's very powerful. You can use it for tons of things. Um, and the basic concept here is that you add an animation component to an entity, like a box, or in our case, it'll be the ocean. And then you choose which property you're going to animate. And we're going to do the same thing. We're going to be animating a position. And you can choose from and to. Um, so in this case, it's just animating to a certain area. And then the duration, how long it takes, um, the type of easing, and whether or not it loops. So we're going to do something really similar, but I just wanted to show you kind of the basic documentation. Um, and so what we want to animate is the ocean. Where is the ocean? Aha, ocean plane. OK, that's the one. Uh, and we're going to add an animation component to it. Uh, so what are we animating? So we're going to animate the position of the ocean. And we already know where it is at the beginning. It's 0, 0, 0. So at the center of the scene. So we're only going to give it a 2. So where is it going to go? Well, we want it to go 150 meters. I think this means away from us. Um, you can just do plus or minus, figure it out, and just test it. And I want it to go over 150 meters in approximately 8 seconds. And I just kind of played with this until I found something that worked well. Um, and we want it to loop. And then we want to have it have linear easing, which means it doesn't slow down or speed up. It's always going a constant speed. So if we did this properly, we should be able to just reload. And we'll see the ocean now moving. There we go. Now, if we zoom out enough, what we should be able to see, I may need to adjust the distance. Aha, here we go. We can see it. So you can see that the ocean moves 150 meters. And then after eight seconds, boop, it moves right back. So you can see that we're kind of cheating. Um, but for a number of reasons, I think it is easier to have the background move and to have our main characters and objects and the camera especially to stay constant for the stuff that we're doing. Um, now, Aishigal, you brought up a really good point, that if we want to make this VR friendly, I think we would 
uh, bring the helicopter and everything down to like the height uh, that we want um, for the viewer to see, like one or two meters. And then uh, we would adjust the rest of the scene uh, mm -hmm. as appropriate. Um, and one idea I had, and this is going to be probably beyond the time we have today. Um, if we look in the helicopter, it's pretty plain. But we could add like a nice floor with some sort of like metal grating texture. And this, again, could be another episode. But we could actually come up with a way to put the VR user inside the helicopter. And that can be another type of game. Um, mm -hmm. There's this concept of like a rail shooter where you're in a fixed place. You can't really control where you're moving. But then you control like where you're shooting. So we could do a Paperboy Helicopter Edition <laughs> in a future episode. Um, that's a really good point. Um, and I think we should get into VR in maybe our next uh, our next episode. Um, so now we have the animation. And we have the ground moving. Um, and so this is kind of the you know V1, V0, whatever you want to call it, um, endless runner, <laughs> endless flyer for the helicopter. Um, so the next thing we're going to do, we're going to take a little pause. But um, after a pause, then we're going to add some more things to the scene and make it uh, look a little more exciting. Um, but maybe we'll take a, a little pause here and see how people are doing. Um, ask any questions. Yeah. Maybe some more dad jokes. <laughs> um, <laughs> Phil Matri, uh, he wanted to share the screen uh, shot, but I don't know how to enable you to add a, an image here. If anybody else knows, do let me know, please. I looked at. And the Phil was showing off the. Um, uh, VR viewpoint of yes. the application, was mm -hmm. that it? Yes. Cool. Um, um, we'll get a little meta here and look at the Twitch stream so uh, it doesn't save the chat and I can't see it. Okay. Um, OK. I wanted to have a little bit of coffee, so I'm going to take a 10-second break to drink something. Cool. Anybody ha has any dad jokes? <laughs> <laughs> Last time, we did get a few good ones. Um, we should come up with a VR-related uh, data. Yeah. <laughs> yep. OK. Uh, um, well, yeah. let's continue. And what I wanted to do next is add some more things to the scene to make it exciting. And of course, because we did this in the first episode, I'd like to add the street component. So we're flying over a street that has kind of buildings and roads and stuff like that. So adding this is actually pretty easy. Um, I'm going to jump to the, uh, the finished version of this exercise. Uh, and I'll keep the old one open so we can kind of compare. Um, but the only thing we really need to add are the streets. And so you may remember that we can use Street Mix to design the, the setting, the streets that we want. Um, so let's take a look here. So that we need to do two, two things. We need to add the street component. So I've added it here. And then the other thing we need to do, there's actually a couple things. Um, I needed to change the scene. Um, I wonder if I did that for this one. OK, you know, I didn't mention something the last time uh, that I should mention. We did two things in the scene that I want to let you know about. Um, one of them here is color management. That's the other thing that helps the HDRI scene look good. Um, so it uses uh, physically correct lights, um, and it uh, you just want to make these things true. <laughs> that's, that's the quick answer. Um, the other thing that I always have in my projects is the GLTF decoder, because a lot of objects that I use uh, have been, sorry, the Draco decoder, because a lot of objects that I use have been uh, Draco compressed. It's just a way of compressing image, or, uh, objects even more than what we had done in our example. It's a way to squeeze even more compression out of it. Um, so those are things that we changed in the scene. Um, the other thing we're going to look at in a moment is the stats component. So I added that in there. All this other stuff is the same. And then we've added the streets. So we still have the ocean. But I changed something here. And maybe you'll notice. Um, so what I did is that I, uh, here we go. I created a parent called ground that I animate. And then underneath it, I have two children. I have an ocean, and I have the selection of streets. So let's go back to our basic example, and let's compare and contrast. So in this version, I animated just the ocean, the basic version, right? But in the new one that we're doing, I want to add more things to the scene. And so instead of having separate animations for each of them, 
I made them children of the parent entity. And you may remember from the last episode that all of the children will inherit the position and rotation, essentially the translation and the scale of the parent entity. So this is a way of just being a little more efficient so I don't have to put animation on the ocean and animation on this street and animation on this street, et cetera. I just put it one time on the parent and then it achieves the same visual effect of us flying through the air. The other thing I've added to the scene is a little bit of fog. We'll look at that in a moment and you'll see why that might be helpful. And then of course I've added the streets. Um, and so what we do here is that we have four streets. Now you may be asking, why did I do four streets? Well, they're the same one. So let's take a look at what it looks like in street mix. And then, yeah, so I had a little scene with some trains, a bus, bike lane, uh, kind of hard to see, but on one side it's the ocean. That makes sense with our ocean part. And the other side is some buildings. Um, and the reason I've added them four times is to have enough length that the user doesn't see them jumping, like when we zoomed out and saw the ocean jumping. So you see it here, and it looks a little dark for a moment. And that's because the lighting hadn't loaded yet, that five megabyte file. So that's it, you can get really deep down the rabbit hole of how do you optimize loading so it looks nice, all this stuff. Um, so now we see our scene, and we see the helicopter flying above our road, which is one of the goals we had for, for today. Um, now I'd like to talk about a bunch of different things going on in this scene. So let's start with the animation and the street part. So I'm going to go to the inspector. Um, actually, let's zoom out first, and then I'll go to the inspector. So just like before, you can see uh, you can see it up there. I have a little background light of my own. That the scene kind of jumps because everything's moving for eight seconds, and then it jumps back to the previous position. But you can't really tell because the scene you know it's repeated a bunch of times. So Unless you're really looking for it, um, you're not going to see that effect. Uh, so that works pretty well. Um, there's pros and cons to it. Now, the other thing that we loaded here was the, um, the stats component. So to understand why that matters, I'm going to go into the inspector. I'm going to zoom out. And just to give you a sense of what all is going on here. So it doesn't look great, but you, you can see we have one, two, three. We have four streets. And each of these streets has tons of objects. It has buildings and lights and plants and street lanes and streetcars. And these have been naively cloned or copied as new objects each time we do this. So they're different entities. So there are literally hundreds of entities, each of which with its own draw call. And this seems a little technical, but it's important for us to understand some of these components. And so the stats components lets us see the stats of our scene. Um, so at the top, it shows frame rate. Uh, I think this screen, uh, the way it's connected, only lets me do 30 frames a second anyway, so it's capped at 30. Um, it shows how many textures are there, which is actually a fairly large number, it's too big, 400. A lot of geometries, which is not the end of the world. Um, a lot of triangles, although this isn't too bad, but then the real issue here is our draw calls. Now, um, what is a draw call? The quick answer is it is sending an instruction to the GPU to render an object. Um, if you have too many of them, it takes too long each frame to give this instruction, and it slows your scene down. Yeah. There's uh, one question. How could the uh, Hilo be able to drop a cable hook kind of gizmo to pick up rafts mm -hmm. on oceans? That's a good idea. Or um, cars or trees. Yeah, so I think the. Uh, the first question is, what does the ladder look like, or what is the object? The easiest thing to do, we can do this live. Um, we can just add a box to the helicopter as a starting point. I know the box isn't pretty, but you know, it starts. <laughs> it's something. Um, so let's do that now. So we want to actually just make a box. And we'll probably make it like 10 meters, uh, and then width and depth. Um, Let's just start with this and see what that looks like mm -hmm. if it's positioned correctly. We want to move it up mm -hmm. about 10 meters. So we'll add a position element. We'll do zero to 10 meters high. Let's see how that looks. OK, so we have the rough positioning. Now what we could do then is we could we could tweak it a little bit. Like you could put it here by the door. Let me zoom out a little bit in the inspector and figure out. So this is one of the tricks I use is uh, I'll use the inspector. Um, I know I can look at the position right now. That's just what we typed in, 0, 10, 0. I can move this over a little bit. 
I could move this over a little bit and maybe move it down a little bit. So I'll try to remember 1.39 and negative 1.3. Oh, that's nice. I didn't know you could use Gizma. Yeah, the inspector is really helpful to kind of get the basics. So there we go. This is this. You can imagine we can replace this with a, a ladder or a hook. Um, so this is a start. Um, now, how would you trigger that? I don't think that today I'm going to get into the specifics of how we trigger animations, but at least I can uh, give you a sense. So this, we might want to go. To, oh, so we want to do property, property, position, and we want that to go uh, to. Now let's actually do something else. I'm going to do scale. And the default for scale, if you don't type it in, is 111, which means it's normal size. Um, and it's the same axis as before. And so I think in this case, we want to extend the hook. Um, and that means we need to both change the location. So we're going to have two animations. Uh, so and we can chain them. This is a, another good thing to learn. Um, I think this is how you do it. Huh. I think that's how we, we'll, we'll find out in a moment. <laughs> uh, yeah, in a moment. Yeah. Um, so. <laughs> We want to make this, uh, so let's say we start out and it's not very big. So it starts at like five. And that means we need to make the position uh, five higher. We want to go to, uh, that would be zero, sorry, one, two, one. So we want to double the height in our animation. And then we're going to be moving this down. So we want to change the position to 1.3. And then we'll go back to 9 and then 1. So my question is, um, when does the oh, duration? OK. So what's missing here is okay. that I don't think we're going to have time to do today. Um, and honestly, I just need to also figure out kind of the right constructs that would be educational and not too complicated and doesn't need too much JavaScript to then um, trigger it at a certain time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> so this isn't exactly what we want. <laughs> not not quite what we want. It's a good start. Well, it did work. It's a good Great. start. Yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think what's happening is that as we scale, it also is affecting where the position is for some reason. I don't know. Um, so that it gives you a sense of how you could start doing it. Um, you know, next we would look at tweaking the animation a little bit, finding the actual the real object that we want, um, and then we would talk about triggering. You know, when do we trigger the animation? Um, but it, that's going to be too much for today. Uh, and by the way, just a time check: um, do we have another thirty minutes? Is that? Um, well, actually, this was I, I scheduled one hour, but feel free to go over if you want to. OK, maybe we'll just do maybe another 15 minutes um, and then kind of uh, wrap it from there. Um, oh. I'm going to I'll leave this here. But what I'm going to do, if you want to reference this, I'm just going to comment this. So it's still in this file. And you can clone Street Flyer Advanced. Um, and then if you want to access that box uh, as a kind of a starting point, um, you can just uncomment this uh, and remix it and play with it. Um, and you do the same thing that we just did. Like we're just playing with these numbers <laughs> and <laughs> seeing what seems to work. So there's, it's not magical like fanciness. It's literally just kind of trying, change something, see if it looks good or not. Um, so hopefully that kind of answered the question of the starting yeah. point for how you make a ladder kind of go down in the hook. And that is a really cool game dynamic too. It's a good yeah. idea. CP66, CP, he said, uh, very cool. Thank you for uh, trying that out. Yeah, that was fun. Um, so we added the streets. We did the orbit controls. Uh, fog, let's see a little bit about why we added the fog. So in theory, if we were making this fancy for you know, making a real game we wanted to publish, you don't want the user to see that there's things jumping in and out of the scene in the background. And so I added a little bit of fog so that for most of you, you can barely see, unless you're really looking for it, 
that there's buildings jumping ahead of you. You could see it a little bit. Um, so the fog fades into this kind of gray color. So it's just a little fanciness. It's easy to do with A-frame. Um, the two areas you add it to are the scene. So I've added it here. I had to experiment with some of the settings. I found this was the right setting, exponential and density. You can read up more about that in the A-frame docs. Uh, and then the other thing I do is I take fog off of things like the sky, because we want to still see the sky, uh, as well as the ocean. So those are two things I wanted to keep there, but I wanted the rest of the things in the scene to kind of fade out in the background, to kind of hide over our little animation trick that we do. Um, OK, let's talk about draw calls. So draw calls. The quick answer is there's a limit of how many different things in your scene can be drawn. And the way to get around this is a technique called instancing, where with one draw call, you put many things in the scene at the same time. Different devices have different limits of how many draw calls or how many textures or what amount size of textures you can support. But the thing that's really frustrating about web 3D stuff is that there is no one answer of what the limit is, because it depends on what your users are, are using. So I found that Chrome on a desktop is very forgiving. You know, this scene is working pretty well at full frame rate that this monitor supports. Um, but a mobile device is probably going to crash if you load this. Um, and it's not going to give you a warning. It doesn't even tell the JavaScript file that it's, something's wrong. It just crashes, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, and so this is why the stats component is so important, because we need to inspect the scene and, and see, you know, are there easy answers of why this might be crashing? Mm -hmm. And here, uh, yeah, uh, go ahead. One question. The street view, so how many? How many objects is that? A lot. So I think each okay. of these streets, wherever we have four of them, is probably two to 300 draw calls. Yeah, because um, there's it's lots very of objects inefficient. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what I should be doing instead, and I hope that this will be maybe not the next one. We'll, we'll, it sounds like we should do VR and interaction for our next one. Um, but maybe after that, we can go even deeper into optimization of how do we group placing these objects into a scene under one draw call. And it's, this is a perfect example of doing instancing, because we can make all these buildings one draw call, but it takes additional JavaScript development. So um, even I am kind of learning the right way to do that. Yeah. Uh, Field Matt 3 says that this is too slow for Quest. Correct. The that scene. is exactly an issue. That is yeah. exactly the issue, right? And, and, yeah. and, and the helicopter is flying really fast. I mean, if it, if it was a person walking, maybe it might be a little bit better, but yeah. Exactly. So the simplest thing to do, if we really just wanted to hack this, is um, let's just take the things that are far away out of the scene. So we yeah. just reduce um, the number of, I don't know, maybe we'll take these two off. That already starts to help. Um, now the other thing you can do, and this is what we're going to do for today. Um, so this already has many fewer draw calls. Um, you can also restrict the viewport of the scene. So you can have these things in the scene, but you can control where the user looks. Now, this doesn't work for VR, <laughs> right? But it works for two-dimensional contexts. Um, and I've done two things. One of them is I, uh, let me undo those things. Um, I made a version of this that's almost guaranteed to crash. So it's just kind of fun. Um, now, Chrome is so good that it usually just crashes a tab, and I can keep broadcasting. But there's a chance I might uh, have to call you back. <laughs> yeah. um, but this scene is especially egregious because it loads hundreds of mm. vertical delineators or safe hit posts. So I was trying to make the scene crash. And here we have 1,000 draw calls, which <laughs> I think is a practical limit. Um, you shouldn't even be close to that. But mm -hmm. I'm amazed that uh, Chrome handles this so well. But I don't want people to be discouraged because it is totally possible to make these scenes performant and look good. Um, and we will do that in our future episodes. Um, um. Also, maybe we could um, shorten the distance uh, for the camera, right? Far could be exactly. important. And since we have yep. fog that would fit into the scene, it would be like, oh, there's a fog and we can't see because of that. That's right. Um, that's a good way to do it. And so this is actually an example of uh, restricting where the camera is looking. Mm -hmm. And since we're just looking top down, we don't see the rest of the scene. Um, and this is a technique that you can use to kind of control, well, how much can even be shown based on the camera position? Um, so the real solution is to, to use proper instancing, but you can have all these kind of hacks. Um, and there's another example of this here. Um, well, that's what I just showed. Oops. Um, 
so you can just restrict the camera position, and that helps a bit. Um, but we do want to dig in in future episodes and how we can make this performance uh, and usable in VR and low on low character, sorry, low capability devices like the Quest, which is a good target. Um, Looking to the see fish are okay. <laughs> um, so I don't know how much more we want to do. Maybe I'll just kind of just introduce this, and people can look at this on their own afterwards. But um, I did the same concept, but then I uh, instead of a helicopter, I found this character, this robot. Um, the scene's still loading, but uh, I found this robot um, that looks kind of cool. Um, I did the same thing, by the way, that we did at the beginning. I reduced the texture. Uh, and that really helped a lot just to reduce the file size of this robot. Um, and then similarly, you know, you can restrict the camera viewpoint um, a little bit so that you don't run into the draw call issues with. This um, is really nice. Yeah. Uh, Blue at 28 is asking how to bring the frame rate counter viewer again. One more time, how to make, how to do it? How do I put this thing here? Mm -hmm. uh, there's two ways to do it. Uh, the easiest is, uh, let me just show you the code. Uh, we'll go to, I think it was the Street Flyer Advanced. Let me open this up, and we'll look at the actual code. Um, I'll describe it, and then we'll look at it. It is in the scene tag, you add the stats ah. component, and you ah. just add that one word to it. Now, there's another thing you can do if you're already in a scene. You can open up a console, and you could do something like A-frame scenes. Uh, this set attribute stats. Oh, that's like that. awesome. So then that's another way you can do it. If you have a scene that you don't control the code for, you can add the stats on top of it. Mm -hmm. um, just to, and that, of course, that's an A-frame specific thing, but um, this is actually a 3JS component that they chose. You know, that's the stats thing that they want to use. Um, cool. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. This was really nice. We, yeah. we we've done a lot actually. <laughs> I mean, we we have. And I think it sets us up nicely. I really appreciate the comments from people about what they're interested in. And it sounds like uh, character movements and getting this back into VR are two things that we could focus on in future episodes. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us. And uh, leave us any comments here or on the YouTube channel, WebXR. Um, and tell us what you want to see or uh, any, any other comment that you have. Thank you.